Thanks uh, to NVIDIA and NVCene for inviting me and having me speak here. Um, I got a lot to cover, so I'm going to dive right in. When I was 12 years old, my father brought home an IBM PC 486, and it had absolutely no impact on my life at all. I, I didn't understand why anybody would want to sit in front of this thing for hours at a time. I think I shared my mother's point of view of you spent how much, and I promptly ignored computers until I went away to um, a science and math uh, pre-college program for 11th and 12th grade. And um, uh, Dr. Heinz Otto Peitgen came by and gave a lecture about chaos theory and showed us uh, the Mandelbrot set. And I think that was the first time I'd thought of math as anything but uh, frustrating. I didn't realize that it could be also very pretty. Uh, a friend at the time had a computer in his room, so we went back to his place and he coded up um, a Mandelbrot viewer. I still don't know how he did it so quickly, and we spent many long nights just looking at really slowly rendered deep zooms of the Mandelbrot set. And I, I started to get a taste for computers, but um, I ended up going away to art school. I went to the Rhode Island School of Design for college, and uh, that school at the time was very traditional, so um, there wasn't any computer curriculum at all. Uh, and I proceeded to make my way towards a degree in sculpture. And in my senior year, the teacher informed us that it might be useful if we created an online portfolio so that it would be easy for us to get a job after school as if I was going to get a job with a sculpture degree. Um, but needlessly, I went ahead and started to learn uh, some beginner HTML and JavaScript so that I could make a portfolio. I didn't really know what I was doing. And I was very bad at it, but I managed to get something running on Netscape Navigator and probably no other browser. And then uh, Flash started to really take off. Flash 3 um, was the first version that I became familiar with. And it was, um, it was pretty groundbreaking, because I could create uh, digital art now and fairly easily post it online and potentially reach a, a very large audience. So I sort of pushed the sculpture degree aside and started to explore using computers for art. Um, I got really good at Flash, particularly making Flash rich media banner ads. And I ended up starting a company with some friends called the Barbarian Group, where we uh, earned most of our income doing Flash-based banner ads. Uh, I got tired of making those, as you could imagine. And it was around that time that I got introduced to processing, which is um, a framework for doing graphical coding with Java. And I was very much a fan of doing um, particle simulations, but Flash at that time couldn't really handle but maybe 200 particles before it would really start to get bogged down. But uh, with processing, you know, 10, 20,000 particles was, uh, was very easy to achieve at 60 frames per second. So um, I never really looked back. I promptly forgot how to use Flash. Um, and I proceeded to spend all my time coding and processing. I, through processing, got introduced to OpenGL and started doing some really basic immediate mode stuff. Slowly make my way to GLSL, which was fantastic. And that was a huge leap in my work because um, I just didn't think it was possible to do that many calculations per frame. Uh, so I was really impressed with what GLSL was able to allow me to do. Eventually left processing behind because a friend of mine, Andrew Bell, was working on this uh, C++ framework. And I kept asking him Java questions, and he kept telling me that if I'd switch over to what he called man-style coding, he could help me. <laughs> and reluctantly, I started to code in C++. Um, coming from an art background, that was a really difficult choice for me because, I, I mean, even now, I'm still not really sure how pointers work. And my coding style is one where I'll try an asterisk, and if that doesn't work, then I'll, I'll use an ampersand, and eventually, there's the right combination, and the thing will compile. It's not funny. <laughs> uh, my work has trended towards three main categories. The, in the early days, it was about doing audio visualizations. This is an older piece from, I don't know, 2000 and something I worked on with Andrew Bell. This was actually my first experience with GLSL shaders, putting uh, some nice lighting on those tentacles. I'm going to be like a really horrible DJ up here and just skip out of these videos because otherwise the talk will run really long. Um, my love of first-person shooter video games got me interested in doing terrain simulations. 
uh, and I'm just going to show one of those that I've been working on recently. Um, I don't like having to worry about, you know, objects in the distance, so most of my simulations are really occluded by plant life. Uh, but I spend most of my time these days doing uh, scientific and sort of nature-based simulations. Um, just a, a really simple example, I was looking at some dust motes floating around in a beam of light, and I just wanted to see how well I could reproduce it. And uh, I used my friend High's um, fluid library uh, combined with some OpenCV so that you could uh, push the dust particles around using uh, computer vision and a, a nice fluid response. So real quick, I'm going to explain how I went from doing um, timeline-based keyframed flash animation to the more procedural stuff that I'm doing now. So in the early days of flash, if you wanted a circle, you had to draw a circle on the stage. You had to give it a color. You had to say where it was. You had to say what the radius was. Um, and it was, it was a very manual process. And if you wanted different circles, you had to draw them differently. And this is um, probably the ugliest slide I've ever prepared. So uh, it just gets better from here. If I wanted the circles to move, I had to drag them to their new position. I had to um, create a tween between them. And I had to do that for every new position that I wanted this circle to move to. And um, this got r really tiring. And it's, it's not only time consuming, but it doesn't leave any room for surprise because you're manually dictating what every frame is going to look like. You're never going to be rewarded with something unexpected. So if I wanted something more complex, you know, keyframing just wasn't an option. Um, something like this would be impossible to do with just keyframes alone. Although impossible is probably the wrong word. I'm sure somebody's figured out how to do uh, really <laughs> complex things using keyframes. Um, so uh, it occurred to me that I could use uh, some math to push these circles around. I would just uh, create the circle and then apply a force to it, and then the circle would go to a new place. And um, something that would take an incredibly long time to do by hand can now be automated and uh, tweaked and executed in a fraction of the time. And this was a really powerful realization. So now the question was, what do I move these particles with? So first up is just random, random vectors. You give each circle a random vector and just watch it move. And um, I think that's how uh, cursor trails were born. You could use something like a flow field, in this case, a Perlin noise flow field. You drop the objects in it, and then they get pushed around by this invisible current. I started to include audio, uh, analyze audio, and then use the FFT and amplitude data to, um, uh, to adjust the properties of the circles that you're dealing with. But despite these methods, I, I still wanted more because these circles existed in isolation. Um, even though they shared the stage with thousands of other circles, they didn't have any awareness of each other. They didn't, um, uh, they, they, they ignored each other because they, they just weren't aware of the, the other ones on the stage. And I wanted these circles to be aware of each other. I wanted there to be some interaction. I wanted them to exchange information and I wanted them to somehow impact one another whether that be through an attractive force, which would bring particles together, as evidenced by this video filmed by uh, astronaut Don Pettit aboard the International Space Station. Particle agglomeration. Here we have a gallon-sized plastic bag filled with one millimeter diameter sodium chloride crystals. You shake this up, and the individual crystals will rapidly form agglomerates, and these in turn form flocules of the order of several centimeters on a side. And if uh, I chose to, I could just reverse this force and make it repulsive so these objects would want to move away from each other, um, as shown in this uh, ferrofluid phylotaxa study by Dwadi and Kude. And they're dropping ferrofluid onto a, a silicone oil base, and then the magnetic uh, forces within this ferrofluid just start to push all the other particles away, and it can form these really nice, naturally occurring spirals. So this is what I spent a few years working on, is just figuring out ways to get these particles to interact with each other um, with both attractive and repulsive forces, and they form this really nice sort of dynamic interplay. And then I entered my uh, additive blending years, which probably lasted way too long, uh, but also started to include audio uh, analysis in these studies because I didn't want the particles to settle down once they found the right spot. I wanted them to continue being really active and energetic. So 
I would allow each particle to listen to the incoming audio data. It would listen to a specific range of the FFT spectrum and then use the amplitude um, to uh, influence how strong the magnetic charge was or um, uh, the radius, uh, the other physical properties. So I made this project called Magnetosphere and it, it did pretty well. It's, um, it's pretty uh, upsetting to look back on it now and see um, just how dull it was <laughs> ultimately. Uh, the camera angles were uninspired, but at the time I was really happy with this because it was unexpected. I didn't know what I was going to get when I hit run. It just sort of worked out really nicely. Um, a, and my, my friend Andrew and I ended up uh, tweaking it and modifying it, and eventually it became the, um, the current um, the default iTunes uh, visualizer. I revisited it a couple years later just to spruce it up a bit. But this is, I think, still probably around 2007 when I made this version. Again, sorry about the rapid change. I should have faded these out. Uh, a couple years ago, I started working on this version, which is similar. There's not much of a repulsive force. This is just universal gravitation acting on a bunch of particles in a space. There's a conservation of mass, so anytime two particles collide, the larger particle takes mass away from the smaller one. Once that particle gets large enough, it ignites into a star, and at that point, it can absorb. <sighs> it can ab <laughs> it can absorb all of the other particles that that hit it. Um, once it gets too large, it supernovas and ejects all that mass back out into the system. Um, so you can just leave this running, and it will just constantly evolve and degrade. And it's pretty obvious that I have a love for spheres and forces acting on spheres, which is why I started to buy um, spherical magnets in bulk, because w why not, right? And I started to make these uh, mathematically inspired pieces that eventually sort of took over my living room. Uh, I have about 50,000 magnets now. I had to take all these apart when I moved to Brooklyn from San Francisco, which was a real shame. So. Um, I need to get back to working with them eventually. Uh, so I'm going to show off um, some space-themed visualizations. Uh, first one is Planetary, which I made with Bloom back in 2009. Um, we were trying to come up with a, a way to um, visualize the music library on your iPad in a, in a novel way, something that hadn't been um, seen before. Uh, the in original inspiration came from these photos of Saturn taken from the Cassini orbiter. I was really intrigued by the way that uh, the moons would sort of interact with the rings and orbit around the planet. The concept was pretty basic. The, your entire music library uh, on your iPad would be uh, the galaxy metaphor. Uh, each star in that galaxy is uh, an artist. If you zoom down to star level, that star will have some planets. Each one of those planets is representative of an album by that artist. And then further still, the moons around the planets are tracks uh, from that album. And uh, we did some extra little bits with the data, like the play count for any particular song would influence how large the moon was. Um, the amount of time it took the moon to orbit around the uh, planet was equal to the track length. So uh, we ended up doing some, um, I don't know, some really aesthetically pleasing visuals, even though we needed to make this run on the iPad 1. We didn't use any shaders for this. It was all um, geometry and some billboarded sprites. Uh, but I like projects like that because it, it, it presents these little problems that pop up along the way, like an interesting way to texture all these planets because you don't want them to all have the same texture. So uh, we figured out a way to um, take the album name and the artist name and turn that into a number, and then we use that number to crop out a section of the album art. And step two, you just mirror image it uh, so that you can sort of wrap it around a sphere kind of seamlessly. And then you add in some extra graphics, uh, some pre-prepared sort of rocky terrain graphics and clouds if it makes sense. And then you can get you know, a decent variety of looks from that alone. If, um, uh, if a, a planet had a bunch of tracks on it, it would be represented as a gas giant. If it just had a track, it would be a smaller sort of mercury-like um, ball of rock. The other interesting challenge was a way to do a decent looking galaxy that could be interacted with with touch events. Um, because most people, it turns out, don't actually put music on their iPad, but some people were adding some music just so they could see what this experience looked like. 
And we didn't want them to have a, a super subpar experience because they didn't have you know, 500 artists on their iPad. So this is the solution that we ended up with. It uses a combination of uh, some concentric rings of geometry to represent that side view occlusion, and then a couple planes of a spiral galaxy graphic. Um, and that sort of fades out depending on what angle you're looking at it. And happily, it's, um, it was acquired by the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt Design Museum as their first digital acquisition. So now it lives as uh, printed source code on one of their shelves. Uh, it's been given the designation DIG001. But the source code is also available from the Cooper Hewitt site if you want to see how poorly commented the code is. Uh, a while later, I was asked to work on a project for the 100-Year Starship Initiative, uh, which is a group of um, dreamers who are trying to get um, us talking about what it would take to start doing interstellar travel within the next 100 years. Um, they're not yet providing solutions. They're mostly just trying to figure out what the problems are associated with traveling multiple light years. But uh, their hope is that within 100 years, a lot of these problems have been solved. So they wanted a screensaver uh, that ran on Mac and PC that would allow the viewer to visit some uh, 43 of the nearest stars in, uh, in our galaxy. I downloaded a database of 100,000 stars and then plotted them. Most of them are just being plotted as GL points because you never get close enough to them to see them as anything other than dots. Um, uh, a few hundred are close enough that they're being represented as billboarded um, uh, sprite vectors or uh, sprite images. And um, the 48 that you actually travel to are represented by spheres with some nice uh, shader effects and some you know, surface um, uh, like. Uh, it called uh, surface patterns that are reminiscent of what you see with uh, stars. Here's a, just a really short video showing some of the different effects. Because this experience was more about the journey than the destination, there's little factoids that appear at the bottom as you're going from one star to another that tell you how long it would take if you were traveling at the speed of Voyager or if you were driving 65 miles an hour, or how many generations it would take. So it, it sort of, unfortunately, it made the task of interstellar travel seem much more impossible. Um, just knowing these little tidbits of information about how, how many hundreds of generations it would take to get to the nearest star, but it was still a fun project to work on. Um, I have been recently working on trying to do an, a nice looking blue marble earth visualization. I, um, I started doing Earth simulations a while ago because it really makes for a nice background for doing data visualization. And at the time, I was living in San Francisco, so uh, earthquakes were constantly on my mind. And I wanted to make um, an app that allowed you to see uh, seven, day seven days of the most recent earthquakes um, and plot them on the sphere. But um, I, I decided to revisit it recently. Uh, and I just want to just go through the steps real quick for how I was able to achieve um, a decent looking uh, Earth simulation. You start with a simple sphere with a directional light source. And you add some terrain details from a height map that you also uh, bring in. And then you wrap the whole thing with a texture of the diffuse color of the Earth, which you can get uh, from the NASA Visible Earth website at really high reses. I think I'm using 16K by 8K for all the textures for this sim. You also want a mask layer because you want the ocean to reflect light differently than the land does. So you can see that the ocean has a bit more of a specular highlight to it. Oh, uh, so uh, you want city lights on the night side. Uh, it's n not the greatest slide for that because most of the night side is not visible. But um, download a city lights texture. Next up, you want to uh, wrap it with clouds. So the, the, I went ahead and subtracted the cloud brightness from the diffuse layer to sort of imply shadows. It's not a, a necessary step. The result is really subtle. And it's only noticeable if you get in fairly close to the Earth's surface. But since I already had the texture and it's one extra texture lookup, I figured, why, did, why not? And then you place the cloud layer on top. But you, in this case, I'm using just a slightly larger sphere than the Earth sphere. So as you do get closer to the planet, you can see the separation between the clouds and the land. Uh, so with the last version, which was um, showing that earthquake data earlier, I, I didn't know how to do atmospheric scattering. And so I decided to fake it 
and it was um, pretty convoluted. I, I, it involved some weird lighting tricks and a gradient lookup table, and it was um, uh, it was hard to control. If I wanted the Earth's radius to be much larger, then suddenly my solution would need to be reworked. But then I found this. Uh, GPU Gems chapter on atmospheric scattering by Sean O'Neill, and I was really impressed with how how real it looked. It was such a simple shader too. There's not much to it, but it was, it was sort of brilliantly done. I think it's over 10 years old as well. And uh, so I sort of poked around at the code that he included and looked at some implementations that are done in WebGL, and was able to add it to my simulation. So this is the before image uh, before I add the atmospheric layer. And then this is the after, and it, it really makes a huge difference. It makes the planet feel more alive. And because I am using 16K by 8K textures, you can get decently close to the surface. And the reason that that was important is because I had just seen the movie Gravity, and I thought that it would be interesting to, um, to use the Oculus Rift to simulate what Sandra Bullock's character went through when she's sort of drifting off structure, flipping end over end. And it was a pretty easy addition. Just a, an additional rotation matrix. But you've got to call it something. So, <laughs> so this way I don't have to comment my code. Um, and this is just a quick video. This actually uses the older Earth model. This was before I started using the atmospheric scattering layer. And it also uses a much crappier sun, which is just, uh, just way too white and bright. But it's nauseating. I, I don't recommend it. But if anybody does have an Oculus around, uh, we can try to plug it in and see if we can get it working. Uh, I'm going to show the demo real quick. Kitty. Oh, just, uh, just real quick. This is that, um, that uh, atmospheric scattering shader. It's just it's fantastic. I love it. Check it out. Um, so this is going to take about 15 to 20 seconds to load. The cursor is going to pinwheel, but it's fine. Um, there's a lot of textures, and I'm not using compressed textures yet, which I've been told is going to speed up the launch time quite a bit. I think there's all total six different 16K by 8K textures, so I'm actually surprised that my, my poor little laptop is able to handle it. So here's the, the, the lighting model. Um, we're going to go ahead and throw the uh, diffuse texture on top of it and zoom in a bit. Oh, kitty! Uh, all right, hold on. Let's see if I can do this. Oh, that's better. I'll have to stare at it from the side, though. Um, so uh, for the sun, I'm using a, a few different billboarded sprites and some uh, faked uh, lens flares. Let's go ahead and get that out of the way. So I'm going to turn on the city lights layer so you can see what that looks like. It's pretty standard stuff. You've probably seen this before with other people's simulations. And then we'll go ahead and throw the cloud layer on top. And then finally, the atmospheric layer, which uh, really sells the illusion. And you can get reasonably close before it start, the image starts to get uh, too pixelated. But um, it, it ends up, uh, I think it ends up working pretty well. And um, just because I like a challenge, I decided to uh, try to do some northern lights as well. And they're audio reactive. Just because, why not, right? Yeah. Yeah. Whee! <laughs> and uh, I think the only other thing worth pointing out is um, there are some thunderstorms as well. Um, but those aren't dynamic at all. I just I, I brought the cloud texture into a separate app and basically just clicked anywhere there looked like there might be a storm, and then brought those points back in and just did a sort of a purple glow that's just randomly placed. Kitty. We good? Okay. Uh, I'm gonna. Oh, that reset my timer. I'm good for time. Never mind. Uh, Flocking, I, I, that's become my specialty. I really like doing flocking simulations because it's surprisingly easy and you can get some really impressive results. And also, I wanted to get um, more comfortable with flocking because uh, my experience with doing flash banner ads really showed me that if you get really good at something, then people will ask you to do that for them for money. 
And I didn't want people coming to me because I was the guy who could make a really solid, rich media banner ad in Flash. I wanted them to come to me because I was able to provide them with something that I really enjoyed doing myself because in essence, they're paying you for your research and it's gonna help you, know, uh, help you push that effect even further. So just real quick, uh, the three rules for flocking as outlined by Craig uh, Reynolds Boyd's paper from 1986 and uh, refined by a conversation that I had with the head of the collective animal behavior department at uh, Princeton. Basically, you have a, uh, an agent, a particle, whatever you want to call it. You do a distance check between the agents. If the two agents are close enough, if they fall into uh, each other's uh, sphere of influence, then they're able to influence each other and exchange uh, force information. Um, I use a sphere. I mean, if you're talking about things like birds or fish, you could make this model more accurate by dealing with the f actual physiology of the creature and paying attention to whether or not their body occludes them from looking behind them. And so the, instead of a sphere, you'd get a more convoluted conical shape. But spheres are much easier to work with, so I stick with them, and the results are, are reasonable. Um, so if, if that sphere of influence is just a repulsive force, then you end up getting something like moths or bats. Um, you've got all these agents that are uh, basically flying around and just avoiding collisions, but they're not doing anything else to each other. You could add a, a second uh, area in that zone that handles attraction. So um, if two particles get close enough, they're drawn towards each other until they're too close and they repel. But that doesn't actually produce very interesting results. If you add the third zone, which is a zone of alignment, if a particle ends up in that zone, then it is compelled to start to match the velocity vector of the source agent. So you get two particles that are just the right distance from each other. They will make an effort to fly in the same direction together. Um, and just from these three zones, you can create a really nice diversity. Um, the, the people uh, at Leap, OcuSpec, uh, wanted me to do a couple demos for their Leap motion controller, and they wanted me to explore flocking. Again, it pays off if you love what you do. Somebody will eventually pay you money to do it. Uh, and um, I was dissatisfied with the number of flocking agents I was getting because I was still doing it on the CPU. Um, so I used this uh, ex project as an excuse to push a lot of that logic to the GPU, which was not easy for me. It was a very foreign way of thinking, uh, thinking of RGB pixel values as XYZ position values. It was just a, a weird mental leap for me. But I was able to get far more particles out of it than I had been able to before, almost a 10 X increase, and I'm certain that can be improved uh, by using other uh, algorithms like binning or octrees or whatever you incredibly smart people are capable of doing. Uh, this is just a quick demo showing what I ended up doing for them. So in this case, if you keep your hand steady over the leap, uh, the fish are drawn to your fingertips. If you start to move your hand around too much, then that frightens them away. You sort of get the gist. So I'm gonna skip over to a quick flocking rules demo. Well, this is gonna be so hard to control from this side. Okay, so I've got this general bounding area that I try to keep all the particles within. They're also drawn to my cursor as well, but I can go down here and adjust um, just how much effect the, the different zones have. So if you turn the repulsion zone down, then all, this green zone basically means all they care about is matching the velocity of their neighbors as much as possible. If you bring that zone back up, then the behavior starts to get a little more uh, randomized. It's um, difficult to tell because they've already fallen into that traditional toroidal movement, but here, as you can see, the, um, the movement's a little more random. Um, I started adding this crowding vector. If a particle has too many neighbors too close to it, then that allows its max speed to go higher. So if I turn that up, um, the brightness represents how crowded they feel. And then if I turn this down, they start to form these really weird tendril-like sh shapes. Let's see if I can emphasize it. 
uh, this is also just a, a force that pulls them in towards the center. So I create these little tools so that I can become more familiar with the parameters because um, uh, just coming up with the right set of values for those three zones is probably the hardest part because um, you could be off by you know a, a tenth um, and uh, that'll be the difference between the system just sort of collapsing in on itself or turning into this really nice organic formation. Cursor. <laughs> so, um, my, my theory about uh, people paying you to do work that you love sort of ended up biting me in the ass when the Auckland uh, War Memorial Museum contacted me because they wanted me to help them with uh, uh, an installation they were working on uh, to help show uh, the phenomenon of the boil up. And real quick, a boil up happens when conditions are just right, usually from the right combination of temperature and favorable currents. There'll be plankton blooms. Um, this large quantity of plankton draws bait fish nearby. And these pilchards show up and they start feeding on the plankton in really large numbers. Because there are so many bait fish around, uh, larger predators start to show up because they want to eat the bait fish. And that tends to frighten the bait fish and they get into this, this um, uh, bait ball formation, which some marine biologists, I think these are probably the optimists in the group, think that they do this because it makes them seem like a big creature and it scares away uh, the predators. But it, it doesn't work, for one, um, because the predators sort of have their way with it anyway. Uh, but I, I put myself in their shoes and I started to wonder, if I were in a crowd of people and I walked to the edge of the crowd and there were people there beating um, you with baseball bats, you'd probably want to go back into the middle of that crowd because the danger is on the outside. So I think this formation appears because uh, they're scared and they're hiding behind their friends. So I think my view is probably a little more pessimistic. So sharks show up and they just swim right through the mass with their mouth open and eat as many fish as they can. Uh, dolphins are a little more conniving. They, um, they attack in a coordinated manner. They attack from below and that pushes the bait ball uh, towards the surface because that's just one extra direction that uh, fish cannot flee to, which makes it easier for them to eat. And they also blow bubbles out of their back anus or whatever it's called. And this creates a, I'm not a marine biologist, this creates um, a net which tends to make the bait ball get into a smaller and smaller formation. And then Cape Gannet circle overhead in anticipation and when the bait ball's high enough, uh, then they get, um, they get attacked by these damn birds which hit the water at speeds of up to 75 miles an hour and dive several meters so that they can feed on fish underwater, which is just freakish and I hate them. <laughs> You'll see why in a minute. Um, and then eventually a whale shows up and just tries to eat the whole thing in one big gulp. <laughs> it's one of the more chaotic displays in nature and I was asked if I could simulate it in code, in real time, for this setup, which was a cylindrical projection. Um, so I would need to do three renders per frame just to make it uh, sort of an immersive single view for the people that are standing inside of this cylinder. So the original thought was to do a, a data visy look, something uh, where uh, there wouldn't be um, much difficulty rendering. And um, you know, up until this time, this was the best looking fish sim I had done. And these are just uh, 2D ribbons so each particle is leaving a ribbon trail. Um, this was what they saw when they came to me. They Googled bait ball and this came up and so they contacted me. So I, I figured they didn't want anything too impressive. They just wanted to showcase the behavior and not so much end up with something that looked real. So I started down the path of doing this data visy look with these big bus shaped fish uh, just sort of plowing through this bait ball. Um, you can see the connections between uh, the the bait fish and, and those connections represent an exchange of force information. But I began to wonder how hard it would be to actually do a decent looking fish. So I went to turbosquid.com and I went to download a fish model. Uh, I got distracted. But this was <laughs> this was inspiring. This was, uh, this was a good sign because um, I hadn't worked with loading in 3D models before and it turned out to be easier than I assumed it would be. So I started down the path of trying to do more realistic looking fish models, but I didn't tell the client because I didn't want to overpromise because I still had to deal with that fucking bird and, 
and the whale, and uh, I, I didn't want to end up doing really nice looking fish only to have this ridiculous looking bird show up. So um, I just continued exploring. It was time to shift gears and focus on trying to simulate the bird's behavior, because it had four stages. The fish were just swimming. These birds were floating, and then they'd fly, and then they'd dive, and then they'd swim, and then they'd repeat the cycle over and over again. So I just wanted to get the behavior nailed down, uh, just so I was, you know, I could get that hurdle out of the way, and I'd worry about the look of it later. Um, started to add the larger predators, like these shark. Um, my client and I both really liked the, the connecting lines, which just show you how the system works. But the end client thought it looked too much like laser beams, and they couldn't get that out of their head. So we had to kill that, which was unfortunate, because um, I think it actually helps with the aesthetic quite a bit. And uh, in order to get the fish to form into this proper bait ball, which I was having trouble doing, um, I ended up adding uh, two additional parameters, fear and crowding. I talked about crowding briefly. Um, but fear, if, uh, if a f bait fish is being attacked, um, their fear level goes up and it propagates out to their nearest neighbors. So the fear sort of spreads through the system, which is what marine biologists told me would probably happen. Um, and in the case of my um, simulation, fear would drive the, the bait fish in towards the center of the bait ball. And so just adding that and a crowding uh, variable allowed these you know, fairly realistic uh, formations of uh, sort of toroidal vortices to form. And I continued to explore uh, uh, pushing the look, added dolphins, added some caustics, uh, eventually added those damn birds, which I admit are the weak link of the simulation because I, I ended up using um, a, a library called Asimp for, doing, um, for dealing with rigged models, but character animation certainly isn't my forte. Uh, so I kind of phoned it in on the birds, but um, you know, whatever, it's, it's behind me now. Uh, this was an interesting bug. I foreshortened the dolphins, and I thought they looked adorable. So, <laughs> screenshot. Um, so I'm going to run the, the demo real quick. It was um, designed to run on an NVIDIA uh, Quadro, so we were able to get away with uh, 12,000 bait fish on my laptop here. We're going to get about 5,000. And unfortunately, the whale shows up right at the beginning. I don't remember how to... Oh, you know what? I'll just not move the window over until the whale goes by. Uh, no, you'll see him. Just give me a minute. The, the simulation was designed so that uh, it was on, running on like a two-minute loop. So at first, the bait fish would show up, um, and they would just sort of loosely flock. And then eventually, we would start adding in predators, like here I'm adding in some kingfish. I'll pull the camera back so you can see them show up. So the kingfish show up, and they start to antagonize the bait ball. Eventually, we'll bring in some kahawaii, which, uh, all right, I just add 110 of them. That's probably too many, but. Um, so uh, kahawaii sort of loosely uh, cooperate. That's why they have connecting lines. We added um, a fish cam, but it turns out it made people really motion sick. So we ended up getting rid of it, uh, which is unfortunate, I think. Seeing YouTube videos of little kids vomiting would have made my day. <laughs> and then we had dolphins. Uh, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but the, the best thing about simulating fish is that um, their movement is really basic. You can sort of fake it with a sine wave, and uh, you can animate them in the vert shader. So that's what we ended up doing. The dolphin uh, would be an up-down undulation, and all the other fish would be side to side. And then we add some sharks, and then we add some birds. but. You get the idea. I'm running low on time. And so that ended up running for three months. And then uh, I think they're going to add it back into their permanent collection at some point um, next year. Uh, David and Goliath, I saw this photo, which won the National Geographic Photo Contest for 2012, I believe. And I was floored. It's so impressive because partially it seems ominous. It just looks like all those fish are staring this guy down. But they're not. They're just swimming in a circle. And this is not, um, uh, they're, they're not fearing predators in this case. I think this is a more of a mating ritual. So they move much slower. It's a little more um, soothing. So I wanted to see how close I could come to simulating it uh, just, just to see. And um, 
here is that demo. Sorry you didn't get to see the whale. Trust me, it's not as impressive as I would have liked. Uh, so here's, here's my fish. I'm going to back the camera out a bit. Am I? Oh, there we go. And I'll speed the timestamp up. So this was the behavior I, I ended up emulating. Uh, it's very similar to what I showed before with the three flocking rules, but in this case, they're all being drawn towards a center line that I'm undulating with a uh, sine wave. Uh, so that helps create these, um, these really nice uh, overhangs in the vortex. So let me slow it down a bit. Go ahead and turn on the model. So this is the Trevely model that I had commissioned from the same guy who worked on the models for the previous uh, installation for Auckland and uh, turn on some specular lighting, really subtle, and then some uh, lighting from below and from above to represent uh, reflected light off the ocean floor and surface light from the top of the ocean. And then, let me slow it down even further. It shouldn't be moving so frantically. Um, and then added some caustics, which is just an animated 32 uh, image loop of faked caustics, which are being projected down onto the top of the fish. Um, I think it, it really adds a, it makes it feel more underwater without having to do things like adding floating particles and bubbles. Um, and then we put them in the ocean scene, which is really basic. It's almost a flat plane for the ground and then a, sort of a cheap uh, ocean um, uh, pattern up top. And, and then we add some fog so that they blend in with the background a little bit better. And then um, we'll throw in one shark for good measure. This was also designed for the with the Oculus in mind, so it's actually pretty um, it's pretty compelling to be inside of the fish while wearing the Oculus. And then suddenly you see all the fish swim away in a specific direction, and you look, and there's a shark coming after them. Uh, it's it it's nervous making. Where is that shark? Has he even shown up yet? Oh, there he is. So he's not predating, he's just gently swimming through. He's, he's having a bit of fun. Uh, so I want to continue to push this look further. I'd like to get 10 times as many fish at some point, but uh, that's a problem for another day, maybe even another person. And uh, finally, where's my cursor? Uh, murmuration is what scientists call large flocks of birds in, in the case study that I wanted to do, I was looking at starlings. I'm sure a lot of you have seen these photos which made the rounds recently. This one was taken last year. Um, and this is just what birds do over fields apparently. And uh, it, they have this really distinctive flocking pattern. So I wanted to figure out how close I could come to simulating that effect. And I actually started yesterday during the, uh, some of the talks that were happening yesterday afternoon and then finished it up in my hotel room. So let's give that a run real quick. Uh, so I'm just using, you know, flat graphic of a field because that's where this happens. And as you can see in the corner, I've got my, um, my zones of influence. And uh, I'm animating the zones just to provide a little more variety. And I've also made it so that uh, the crowding uh, variable affects uh, the radius of the zone of influence. So the more a bird gets crowded, the smaller that zone becomes for each one of them individually. And so this is running with about 11,000 birds. Um, the bird is a, um, an eight poly uh, sort of diamond shape, and I'm, I'm doing sort of a basic wing flap um, in, the, in the vert shader. Um, I don't know, we can try. It, it's, it's unpredictable, so... All right. I, well... I'm sorry about that. Damn you, Kuda. Uh, so that's all I have. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But before... <laughs> Like, uh, before you raise your hand to ask a question, if you're going to, just remember I went to art school. So um, <laughs> there's a good chance I'm not going to have any idea what you're asking, nor will I have an appropriate response, but you can certainly give it a try. So if you have a question, raise hand. And also, as he asks, speak slowly. 
<laughs> and use small words. Can you go back to the breakdown of the last fish and water thing and talk about how you did the seafloor and the, the top of the ocean? Uh, so the seafloor um, was just a VBO mesh that just has some uh, uh, noise peaks to them. Uh, so it's, it might as well just be a flat plane. There's not much there to it. I'm using just a sand texture that's tiled and then also projecting the caustic animation down onto the, uh, the ground. Um, I'm not entirely certain how I did the ocean for that execution. I think I have um, a, a, a normals texture from, in fact, let's see, let's break out of that kernel panic. Um, hold on. All right, code, projects, fish tornado, resources, ocean. All right, so normal surface, normal map. So I'm, I'm using this texture. Uh, I think I'm using two copies of it that are just uh, animated along uh, the texture coordinates and just doing some, you know, lighting trickery. It was a lot of um, uh, just trial and error just to come up with a look that that wasn't too processor heavy, but also wasn't distractingly bad. Uh, and it was, it was just shaders. It's just, <laughs> it's just math in the shaders. Duh. All right, thanks. <laughs> Do you have any uh, interactive adjustment of the render parameters similar to what you had for the um, simulation parameters? Can you ask that again? You, you, you had this, um, you could change the parameters for the flocking yep. um, interactively. Mm -hmm. uh, can you do something similar for the rendering? Do you do anything there? For the, uh, I do sometimes. Uh, usually when I find the look that I want, I'll, I'll take that part out or just comment it out. But um, if, if I'm at that phase of development where I just need to fine tune a look, then I'll, I'll put in some ant tweak bar sliders and just you know, spend an evening with a glass of wine and trying to figure out w what looks best and then you know, hard code those in as magic numbers and then get rid of the sliders. So uh, I do use a lot of pr parameterization to fine tune the look, but you know, sometimes I can't be bothered, so I just keep recompiling after I make a tiny change to one number in the shader because, you know, it's, I don't, sometimes I don't know if it's going to take me two days to nail a look. I assume it's just going to take me a few minutes, and then two days later I think, wow, I really should have just added some sliders. That would have made this go a lot easier, but um, sometimes I forget to. Just you talking about waiting for compile times and experimenting, do you find that's an issue with C++ development and do you miss something uh, like that? It, it's, it's a little frustrating knowing that a five to 10 second wait is sometimes just like way too much waiting time. Um, I don't remember when I got so impatient. So it is a little problematic. I should get to a point where I can just um, uh, reload shaders on a currently running app and that'll just make it that much more streamlined. But you know, I don't generally do things the way that I'm supposed to until uh, someone uh, points it out and makes fun of me for it, and then and then I move on. <laughs> but you know, for these apps, it's not it's not a big deal. It's not like waiting for a render. I don't have five minutes to kill. It's usually well, like for the Earth one, which did take twenty some seconds to launch each time. I made a set of much smaller textures so that I could just toggle a define to low res, and then the, the launch time is a second or two. It's not, a, you know, it's not bad. But when I really want to just get down there and look at the high res version and make tweaks to it, it did get annoying that I had to wait for 20 seconds each time. Um, but that's the price you pay. Uh, there was one kind of fish that you mentioned that you said was coordinated, um, but it didn't look like all the fish had lines between all of them. 
No, so, okay, so um, the, f the fish that were working with each other had connecting lines, which um, was just a really subtle uh, repulsion force. So they never got too close together, but sometimes they would travel as a pack. The lines between the predator and the prey only occurred when they were really close to the prey. Um, otherwise, the, the whole scene would just be a big mess of lines. So uh, when a predator is about to attack prey, you want that um, attack distance to be pretty small because they're, you know, they're swimming towards a large mass. I don't think they know which fish they're going to eat until they get close enough to figure out which ones are still close to their mouths. And then that's when you start to see the lines between the predator and the prey. Um, uh, there was some basic collision detection between the predators of different species. So the Kahawai would avoid the dolphin. The dolphins would avoid the sharks. Um, I don't know if I drew those lines. We might have left those out. Is there anyone else still? Uh, can you make the fish project shadows and ambient occlusion? <laughs> I was just talking to Bent about this. There are a few things that I just never learned, and that's shadows, ambient occlusion, depth of field blurring. Um, those are, are still foreign to me. Um, I'm going to hopefully tackle shadows next because it really does suffer from not having cast shadows, especially on the, the, um, the, the trevely one with the, the fish tornado. Um, not having self-shadowing was uh, problematic. I, I tried faking it. It didn't look great, so I took it out. But um, it's definitely on my to-do list. Ambient inclusion, I'll probably get to soon as well, because after seeing Matt's talk, it sort of made a little more sense to me conceptually. But the, the problem that I suffer from coming from an art school background and not studying computer science is a lot of the vocabulary is lost on me. So I'll see a paper that's like, easy screen space ambient inclusion, and I'll start to read it, and I, I won't get what they're saying because they make assumptions about what skill level you're at. So they start using words that they assume a beginner graphics coder should know. And um, that makes uh, learning from book or from paper very difficult for me. I tend to need to learn from example, um, either from experimenting or from seeing somebody else's code and sort of tearing it apart and seeing how it works. But um, like I, I've read one SIGGRAPH paper in my life and it didn't make any sense. That GPU gems article, I probably wouldn't have been able to do that atmospheric scattering if I didn't also had somebody else's WebGL code to sort of cross-reference. Um, but once I can start experimenting with it, it starts to sink in, and then it becomes a part of my repertoire. But um, that stuff is just hard. It's hard for me. Are you familiar with uh, Side Effects Houdini, which is like a procedural um, visual effects package, and it's uh, free to download? Nope. I'm not. <laughs> what would it be useful for for me? Well, it's, it's uh, they use it for uh, Matrix for the city scenes, and it has a lot of stuff for procedural animation and procedural modeling. But it's for it's for rendering purposes. It's for it's for rendering, but okay. they do have a real time version of it that they promoted for a while. It was used for some Rush concert right. tour, but okay, um, it's pure procedural. So you're basically dropping in modules and uh, signal flows right. for. You could it actually has. Uh, pure procedural for, for rendering and for right. modeling and for animation, and it actually has audio input and synthesis. It sounds like a steep learning curve, if you ask me. Yeah, it's <laughs> actually, but it's really, it's really good, and it's, it's totally free, right. and you can get an apprentice license, which unlocks some features. But okay. uh, it's originally a $17,000 program. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Certainly something to keep in mind. Thanks. Uh, I was just going to add that the, the thing you want to Google is probably derivative ink because some of the early founders of side effects split off and made a version of the package that's targeted towards art installations. Okay. And not, you know, not at all offline rendering, but more, right, more right. online visualization. More for inter interactive stuff. Right. Touch designer. Oh, I'm familiar with touch designer. Well, in that I know it exists. <laughs> um, Oh, one more. I got an, uh, an art, show, uh, art school question for you. Um, <laughs> you remember, like, when, when, remember when uh, you'd have like your first um, uh, figure drawing class? Yes. And you'd be all excited, and, and, and then you get excited. there, and then you get there, and it's just some ugly dude. 
The dudes Does, at my art school were pretty good looking. Doesn't that, doesn't that suck, though? No, it was kind of awesome. Oh. I liked how nervous it made people. All right, thank you. <laughs> so, if no one else, Robert, thank you. Thank you.